Hello everyone and welcome to a lecture on Indigenous traditions. This is um, a PowerPoint that I use in two of my courses. So if you are in Philosophy 210, this is, corresponds to Chapter 2 of our textbook, and if you are in Humanities 224, this corresponds to Chapter 5 in our textbook. So just to introduce what we mean by Indigenous traditions, um, this is a really large umbrella term which captures a segment of religious traditions that are not just older traditions, but tend to um, be practiced by smaller populations, which uh, designate them as separate from what we would classify the other traditions as, as major world religions. So by indigenous, we mean something that refers to the idea that the social and religious lives of a given people are rooted deeply to a given place, right? So the term indigenous here is capturing the idea that these are religious traditions that correspond to a particular geographical location and or correspond to a particular set of ideas about nature, right, that deeply influence those religious traditions. These indigenous traditions, though still practiced in many tribal communities um, around the world today, do trace back all the way back through human evolution to hunter-gatherer societies, right? So we tend to um, associate them more with First Nations uh, individuals, right? Indigenous populations, Native Americans, African communities, South African communities, or South American communities. But as I mentioned, various adaptations of them are still in existence today. Um, many of these remain either in uh, areas where communities have not had as much um, interaction or connection with more global capitalistic communities and so have maintained these older traditions, or they have been subsumed within colonial world religions which have um, come into that region. And so you'll tend to see a blend of them in uh, what we might call newer religious traditions, which we'll look at later on in the quarter. So as I mentioned, um, when these traditions have been subsumed under a colonialist tradition, we tend to see those practices assimilated in those other world religions. So this is gonna be the case um, specifically with uh, practices of mediumship and spiritual worship. Um, as we see them practiced in different types of branches of Christianity, um, as well as uh, other newer religions that we find most often in uh, the South or South America. And again, these main beliefs and practices that sort of capturize most indigenous traditions, even though they vary widely across different regions and different time periods, are the practice of shamanism, which we'll talk more about, as well as soul possession. So you'll notice that the title of this lecture was called Women in Indigenous Traditions. Um, and even though uh, if you're in the Philosophy 210 class, we're not looking specifically at gender, it is important to recognize that indigenous traditions as a whole, again, though there are is a great variety amongst them, do tend to have different views on gender and gender hierarchy than we find in the major world religions, which tend to come predominantly from what we might call patriarchal societies or societies which are male dominated. Now that is of course a generalization, right? Even within a patriarchal system, many men can be marginalized, right? And there can be exceptions where certain women have positions of power. But on the whole, indigenous traditions tend to be more what we call matriarchal, which we'll take a look at a little bit more deeply. But for a general comparison, Indigenous traditions do differentiate activities between men and women. The difference, though, is that they do not mark these differences by any type of superiority or inferiority. Whereas we'll notice in uh, the major world religions, right, both from the East and the West, they tend to differentiate between activities between men and women and as being part of a patriarchal system, the positions that men occupy are seen as having greater authority right, greater respect and greater social status, right? So this places men in a position of power predominantly over those who are subordinated to them. So when we find traditions based on gender in indigenous traditions, again, they might be differentiated based on gender, but they're not demarcated by a certain higher status. And if and when they are given a higher status, those higher statuses tend to be reserved for women 
or interestingly enough, people who fall outside of the gender binary. So the gender binary is the idea that there are only two genders and that they're opposite of one another. But many indigenous traditions have a history of acknowledging a third, fourth, or even fifth type of gender identity. And because these are seen as typically um, a combination of aspects of masculinity and feminine, this is seen as giving those individuals a greater supernatural potential, right? So they often get uh, put into positions of high authority within the religion. So again, comparing these indigenous traditions to major world religions, right, we do see Again, participation differentiated between men and women, not only in positions of authority, as I mentioned before, but as is common in many uh, conservative uh, religions, we'll find that men and women are not even allowed to practice in the same ways or practice in the same spaces, right? They have to, uh, men practicing in one area, women practicing in another, or areas where women are not allowed to be at all, right? And so because of this, we see women assigned to inferior roles, right? Typically um, often involving uh, providing food or sustenance or cleaning the sacred spaces. And these roles also tend to be marginal in the sense that we think of them as extra or superfluous or outside of the primary roles. Now this is starting to change in many of the world religions, but of course there are still branches of uh, conservatism within any major world religion and very few of those conservative branches have allowed women to participate in any role of uh, leadership or position of authority. So this is going to be something that, again, is going to take issue not just as we learn about indigenous religions writ large, but also how we can understand the issues more contemporarily, right? Because people who are part of indigenous traditions or indigenous populations uh, tend to be already marginalized and oppressed, right, by the colonizing group or the uh, powerful group in question. And that tends to be especially harsh on women within those indigenous traditions. So by an indigenous religion, right, we're again using this term as sort of a catch-all to encompass any of the remaining cultures that are usually in close relationship to the land upon which the people live. So one of the reasons that these traditions end up becoming marginalized is because they trace their origins back um, so far in, in human history that they have maintained a tradition of carrying on their stories, their myths, their narratives, their practices orally, right? So through verbal communication rather than written down. And this is not just uh, part of a you know, carrying on a tradition, but it's actually served the purpose of maintaining a sacred sort of knowledge that you should only be able to access if you're part of that religion, right? So it's not just for the sake of maintaining a tradition in and of itself, but to also ensure that those, that bit of knowledge is really kept for those who, who respect it, right? And who are willing to participate in it. So even though there are many women who hold positions as religious leaders within indigenous religions, unfortunately, because these indigenous religions have been you know, surrounded or um, taken up within colonialist societies, that patriarchy has seeped in. And so we still find, as I mentioned earlier, um, a sort of double or extra level of oppression that women in these indigenous religions face, uh, primarily in the sense that, um, you know, crimes against them are not taken seriously, if acknowledged at all. And this has to do not only with issues of jurisdiction, right, and different sorts of laws which might be in place in indigenous populations versus the colonial society, but also in the way that we stereotype those groups, right? Um, and so those stereotypes can lend themselves to uh, the reporting of such harms not being taken seriously. So to give us an overview of the way um, in which indigenous traditions sort of view the world, there are some distinctive characteristics that are gonna set them apart, again, even though indigenous religions vary widely, on the whole, they're gonna share some commonalities that separate them from the major world religions. So, as we mentioned, indigenous religions are going to have a, a sacred and meaningful conception of, of the place in which they live, but also with the environment as a whole. This tends to be different from the ways in which major world religions view the environment, which tends to be inanimate, right? So the idea in major world religions is that perhaps 
um, you know, even if a god were to occupy some space, that that god is separate from, right, or the divine is separate from that environment itself. Whereas in indigenous traditions, we're going to see the idea that the environment in and of itself is going to have something divine about it, and so should always be protected, right? It's not seen merely as an instrument for people to use. Another differentiation is the idea that all peoples are relatives, right? So the idea is that every human being, according to indigenous traditions, is going to be connected in some either familial or perhaps more deeply spiritual sense, as opposed to the idea that individuals are separated or that we should have sort of partial treatment towards those who are, you know, perhaps blood relatives or in our communities or something like this. So because this connects with notions that I mentioned earlier in our introduction to religion, like pantheism and panentheism, the notion that the environment is sacred means that everything within nature is permeated by some spiritual power, right? So if you want a sort of, you know, cheesy representation of this, you can think about, um, you know, the Disney film Pocahontas, right? When she's talking about spirits being in the river, right? In the otters, in the trees, right? That everything has a spiritual power and so ought to be considered sacred and treated as such. This leads to the necessity, right, to have a way of connecting to the spiritual world around us in indigenous traditions, which makes the role of authority um, particularly housed in the notion of someone called a shaman. So these are visionary individuals. They can be women or men, um, although historically many of them have been men. Right, you're going to um, see, again, more women occupying any positions of authority in indigenous traditions. But these visionary individuals are seen as having direct access to that spirit world, right? So if it cannot be seen directly in front of us from our every inter everyday interactions, right, then we can engage with this shaman, this, uh, you know, pr privileged and powerful individual who can be called upon and, and goes through intense training to interact with the spiritual forces on behalf of the people. And you can see um, some examples of this in the media that I've shared. Okay, so a little bit more about what a shaman does exactly. The idea here is that although they are a human being, right, so they're not seen as a divine being by any means, they are seen as being capable of, either innately or through their training, as maintaining an, or achieving an altered state of consciousness, right? So they're not sleeping, right, or anything like this, but the idea is that they're having, uh, by entering this altered state of consciousness through whatever ritual that tradition practices, they are seeing or sensing things that other people cannot, right? And so we might call these hallucinations, right? In the sense that they're seeing something that quote unquote isn't there. But the idea is in fact that they're tapping into a level of reality that is just beyond most of everyone else's comprehension. So this is considered a technique of ecstasy, right? So elevating someone's experience um, to a high or a low. Right? So this can involve uh, various verbal um, iterations that perhaps aren't understandable or comprehensible to someone who is not in that same state of consciousness. This could involve uh, physical convulsions, right? Um, all, all types of physical ramifications that sort of signify that this person is having some other type of experience. Now, think what you will about uh, religious experiences in general, but it is important to note that regardless of your beliefs, empirical studies do support the idea that achieving an altered state of consciousness through ritual practice is something that actually does affect the brain. So I think most of the studies that have been done recently have been on um, uh, monks, although I know they've done some others on uh, some uh, very orthodox Jewish traditions, specifically in Kabbalah, which, you know, involves rocking to maintain a high uh, period as, of ecstasy and altered state of consciousness. But in monks specifically, they found that meditation does actually affect the way the brain works, right? So if we think of this as sort of a related category of experiences, the idea is that by engaging in this ritual, something is occurring within that person, right? What it is, I'll leave that up to you to, to maintain. <laughs> 
But the idea is that by going through these techniques, right, through these practices, they can enter into what we might call a trance-like state. So this altered state of consciousness is sort of like a trance, right? Their, their bodies are physically present, but their minds or spirits are occupying another space or experiencing something that is not, uh, that we're not able to experience through our regular senses. And so what we mean by a trance here is the idea that the soul, sometimes in philosophy called the mind, has actually left the body, right? So it is not currently experiencing what one's physical body might be experiencing, but again, experiencing something else, typically either a higher level of ascendancy, right? Depending on what the purpose of the activity is. But we also get the idea that these trances could also let someone descend into the underworld. And we'll see some um, interesting accounts of this actually in Zoroastrianism which involved someone entering a drug-induced state into hell who, uh, and then describing all of the types of punishment that people incurred there. So we see these sorts of practices, again, sort of taken up by re other religious traditions, right? But they're primarily characteristic of indigenous traditions. And this is considered a religious phenomenon because one enters a trance-like state, not just for you know, no reason or for fun. Uh, in fact, these endeavors are described as being very uh, physically um, draining and taking a toll on the individuals who go through them. And sometimes um, the shamans uh, end up feeling very ill for uh, days after they've entered into these states. But the idea is that they are going to acquire some sort of knowledge, uh, knowledge on behalf of, you know, people who seek information from perhaps ancestors or those spirits living beyond the physical world, or also answers to help their community, right? So all, oftentimes the shamans will be um, imbued with uh, the power to heal, right? So gaining knowledge from the divine or the spirits in order to help heal or command certain physical properties in the world. Right, so it's important to understand that even though shamanism is practiced within religions, it is not a religion itself. Okay, and so as such, it can be accompanied by a variety of other practices, right? So shamans will have different practices, different traditions, different techniques, depending on which religion they are a part of. So as a result, it's also found in various religious traditions, as I've mentioned before. But because of that uh, connection to knowledge I mentioned earlier, there is a deep notion, not just that the shaman will have knowledge that the person can use in the moment, but also great historical knowledge. And so this leads us there to be a connection between the shamans and a tr indigenous traditions mythology, right? So their histories, the things they know about the world around them, right, will come as a result of this sort of elevated level of consciousness and knowledge. So we might ask, you know, why there is this deep connection between shamanism and mythology, right? And by myth, I want to make it clear that we're not using this term in the sense that we're implying that the stories are false, right? We use the term myth when we don't have enough empirical evidence to confirm that they are true, right? But that doesn't mean that they're false. And so a myth in this sense is really related to the, the job or other duties of a shaman in the sense that the story is used by a community to make sense of the universe that they are in as well as their place within it, right? So having them as the source of that mythology will help them to do their other jobs better. Okay, so as I mentioned before, um, gender is going to come into play when distinguishing indigenous traditions from other world religions, not just in the sense that major world religions uh, tend to be patriarchal, but also because they exist in what we call patrilineal systems. So lineal meaning the sense that we're talking about the lineage from generation to generation. So in a patrilineal system, right, property, names, wealth, status, these things are all traced through the father's or the male bloodline. Indigenous traditions are not patriarchal historically, although they uh, have been sort of absorbed within patriarchal structures. But one of the things that they've maintained is a matrilineal set of uh, lineology, right? So the idea here is that we trace lineage through the mother side rather than the father in indigenous traditions. The one exception to this is in Judaism, which is also matrilineal. And we'll talk about that more when we get to that tradition.
And so what this, why this is important is not just for the, of course, socioeconomic status of individuals in society, but also because of the spiritual roles that that sort of lineage will grant them. So the relationship here is again a direct correlation. So in indigenous traditions and historically in uh, major world religions, right, the higher social status you have, the higher spiritual status you have, right? So the more status and power you had in terms of your economics, right, your finances, uh, your wealth, right, your uh, consideration of authority, this is supposed to cr directly correlate to how spiritually enlightened you are, right? Or how close to enlightenment you are in whatever way that tradition fleshes out enlightenment. And so what that means is that, right, these individuals have power in both areas. And this can serve to, you know, sort of a cycle because if they're seen as already having power in one sense, it can use them to justify and fuel power in another, right? And so it's not just that they're seen as socially powerful, but that they're acknowledged as having a great spiritual power. All right, so matrilineal is the notion of lineage, but as I mentioned, this comes from the opposition to a patriarchy, which is a matriarchy, or a uh, predominantly uh, women-dominated, but that is not even the right way to understand a matriarchy. So a matriarchy is not the exact opposite of a patriarchy, which is predominantly dominated by men. Matriarchies are unique in that they tend to actually be more equitable across the board for all genders. So in matriarchal societies, very few if any of which exist anymore today, we see more liberal attitudes taken towards sexuality and personal style. So we don't see um, you know, heterosexuality perpetuated as the norm between matriarchal societies. Matriarchies tend to be more open to individuals um, selecting their own way of living, their own way of identifying uh, their own relationships that they want to be in. Some of the unique um, examples of this that exist today are in some indigenous Chinese religions in which there is a practice of um, women living with their own family for their entire lives and they can choose who they want to go and spend the night with and they will go and be with that man but they are not obligated to them in any sense and so the sexual power there is occupied solely by the women to give you a, a contemporary example we also see uh, in matriarchies less aggressive notions of masculinity at, that are elevated right so in a patriarchal society we tend to see the most you know, powerful men as being the most aggressive or the most physically able or something like this. But of course, in matriarchal societies, we tend to see a prominence or an elevation of more passive males and decisive females. So this is something that we um, can see in uh, First Nations or uh, Native American or indig indigenous traditions in, the, in North America, where you might have um, you know, a, a group of men making decisions, but they are advised by women. They tend to be older women, right? So they're seen as having um, a lot of knowledge of the community and its history, and that they will influence those men's decisions. And rather than um, a focus on individuals succeeding, as we find very often in patriarchies, right? So that sort of like pull yourself up by your bootstraps, mentality, matriarchies tend to focus more on social responsibility, which um, comes from a commu more communal sense of self, which we'll talk about more in a minute, but also youth welfare, right? So focusing on taking care of the young rather than just taking care of one's own, right? But a sense that we're all responsible for making sure that all of the youth in that community are doing well and that we're all pitching in in a responsible way. There's also going to be a more equitable, equitable and even distribution of goods, denoting more to matriarchies, and the idea that social control through the mechanisms of social welfare responsibility and youth care will provide a more meaningful pathway to the supernatural rather than what we find in many patriarchal societies, which is the idea that people will be you know, motivated to pursue a relationship with the supernatural for fear of punishment, right? That's something that's going to be a mark of many of the patriarchal societies, but that's not something we see in more matriarchal societies. Okay, so historically, again, matriarchies have been 
have been undisputed in the sense that there is a correlation in them between women in power and greater social well-being, right? So what that means is that when we f have the few examples of patriarchies, I'm sorry, matriarchies that exist, we can see that when we have more women in power, that overall everyone does better in those situations. All right, so this we might ask ourselves why indigenous traditions are more likely to have to be matriarchies or to have characteristics of their traditional matriarchal origins. And that might be seen as being in correlation to their overall worldview. So as I mentioned earlier, right, there is this notion that all people are going to be related in indigenous traditions and that everything in the environment is sacred and connected. And so this captures a unified worldview in indigenous traditions, which is not really present in most of the major world religions, right? So unity of what exactly? Well, of everything. So not just of nature as a whole, and not just of society as a whole, and not just of ourselves, but the unity of all of those things, right? So the idea is that if your sense of self is not so much based on the individual, but on the communal, then in order to take care of yourself, you have to take care of others, right? And if you see that further as an extension of nature, well, then in order to take care of yourself, you have to take care of the environment, right? So again, this is going to be compared to the major world religions, which tend to stress not only an individualized sense of consciousness or the self, but also an emphasis on duality. So this is uh, particularly the case in um, Abrahamic religions like uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but we even find elements of it in Eastern traditions as well. So the idea that there are two, uh, uh, two forces that exist in the world, that they are opposites of one another, and that they oppose one another, right? And so this affects every sort of aspect of the world, whether you see a duality or a unity, right? So in ex uh, for example, how might it affect our conception of time? Well, if we are dualistic, we might think that there is a past and there is a future and that those are different from each other, right? And maybe as a third distinction, they are entirely different from the present, as opposed to a unified worldview, which is the idea that the past is deeply ingrained in our present and that the future, right, is going to be significantly determined by our present. So how might that change our, right, think about how that might change your conception of your actions, right? So in uh, the sense of an in a responsibility to the environment, you hear a lot of people talk about how, well, you know, it's not my problem, future generations are going to have to deal with that. Well, that's based on a dualistic conception of time, right? That that's going to happen at some other sense and is somehow disconnected or not really relevant to what's going on today. Same with space, right? So in a dualistic conception of space, we would have something like those things that are sacred and then those things that are profane, right? The opposite of being sacred. And in this case, right, in indigenous traditions, we're not going to see that distinction, right? Everything in the natural world is going to be sacred. Same with the cosmos, right? The universe itself. They're not going to see a distinction in indigenous traditions between different realms of reality like earth or heaven or hell, right? The idea instead is that, again, those are all existing in the same space, but perhaps we are not able to visually um, or in other senses experience them, right? And hence the need for a shaman. But again, bringing it back to conceptions of the self, right? In major world religions, you're often going to see a distinction between your physical body and your soul or your spirit, right? That one of those things is eternal and the other is finite. In indigenous traditions, we're not going to see that sort of separation, right? One's body is going to be a, a significant part of one's identity. And again, that that could be shared by many things, right? So your physical body might be part of your identity, but you might also share the identity with the spirit of an animal. Right, that's going to be different from what we see in major world religions, where your body is typically not associated with the sacred, but instead the profane, right? And it's something that often is seen as hindering our ability to access uh, spiritual enlightenment, right? That is definitely not going to be the case in indigenous traditions. And as we've already talked about, right, the distinction between men and women, even though there will be some gender differences in practice and one's gender roles, as a whole, again, they're seen as more equal.
Another representation of the uh, empowerment of women, at least historically through indigenous traditions, is the prominence of female conceptions of the divine. So in major world religions, we're going to have mostly masculine conceptions of the divine with a few exceptions, uh, primarily in Hinduism and some um, more contemporary examples of Buddhism and Taoism. But again, most of those can be explained by those major traditions absorbing previously indigenous traditions and maintaining the female gods that existed within them. One of the interesting things to note is that if you go back to the early history of the Abrahamic traditions, you will find that early Judaism actually had a feminine conception of God, but that that was later er it tried to er be erased from history by destroying um, any of the, the evidence of a female conception of God. So this indigenous view of the sacred is considered to be more open to femininity rather than just masculinity because it's considered to be numinous, meaning beyond anything that can be limited in a physical body or presence, right? So the, these are experiences which when we come in contact with the numinous are supposed to invoke, you know, great fear and trembling as well as being fascinating and sort of drawing us in. Right? And by numinous, again, being beyond um, any physical limitation, so not being restricted to one gender. This also tends to go along with the idea that the divine in and of itself is not something that can be given one name. Right, So it is either unnameable or goes by many names. And that their presence is fluid, much like progressive notions of gender identity itself. Right, Something that is always changing and can take on different um, bodies, different presences, different characteristics, and again, that it permeates everything. So one of the words we might use for this idea of a divine being being beyond gender is the notion of amorphous, right? So being without a physical form, right? So does this mean that it is neither masculine nor feminine? Does it mean that it's both, right? We'll see different variations of this in different religious traditions. Um, when we do talk about an entity encompassing both male and female aspects, though, that is specifically called androgynous, right? So human beings can identify as androgynous, right, having both, but we could also describe divine beings as having both masculine and feminine aspects, right? And the point of this is not just that we're elevating, you know, women or something like this over men, but the idea is that we should not be able to differentiate, right, between any people when looking at the divine, because the idea there is that if someone identifies more with the conception of the, the divine than someone else, then perhaps they'll see themselves as being more important than those other individuals. All right, so we can imagine how this would affect social structures. All right, so I'll uh, talk a little bit now about Native American deities as contrasted with African deities. Again, these are generalizations and there's going to be lots of variety within not just any one region but also going back through different periods in history. So Native American deities tend to be anthropomorphized, meaning that they do more often than not tend to be given human form and when they are seen and named they're often associated with the feminine. So this is not always the case but is very often the case. The kinds of powers that these deities tend to have are those over nature, right? So um, also tend, uh, activities that tend to be associated with traditional notions of femininity in terms of bringing and cultivating life. So bringing of the rain, controlling fertility or sterility, the renewal of life, right? In the sense of restoring wholeness, peace or healing, as well as a more creative or artistic intelligent, right? So we might think about the connection that might exist between the worship of female deities and matriarchal societies, right? So is it a chicken or an egg sort of thing, right? Does one cause the other? I will leave that to you to, to contemplate. So contrasting that with African deities, again, this is a generalization, but on the whole, they tend to be less anthropomorphic, meaning they're not given human characteristics as often. They tend to be conceived more as energies, right? So disembodied spirits operating in the physical world, right? And so as a result, we tend to see them most associated with the physical elements, earth, fire, wind, water, animals, 
right? And this is supposed to, again, when it is given any sort of um, anthropomorphic association, it is meant to illustrate the spiritual powers attributed to women, right? So the idea of interacting with the dead is meant to be a sort of flip side of the power of being able to bring life. And this is a sort of interesting association that we'll see um, carried through in Hinduism as well, right? And something that even though Abrahamic religions don't accept, right, they don't, you know, grant women any spiritual power, they do tend to maintain this association between women's ability to not only give life, but take it away, right? So there's something almost fearful about women's spiritual power, which has unfortunately had negative effects in the sense that once you acknowledge a woman's spiritual power and then it is something to be feared, it's something that then has to be controlled. And that typically ends up happening through um, uh, marrying young, very young women, right, or girls. And so even though women are seen as the dominant sex, perhaps having more spiritual power, this is sort of a secret knowledge, right? Something that we don't want to let loose for fear that, you know, it will go uncontrolled and thus uh, create chaos, right? And so the idea here is that men, you know, have to control it and keep it sort of uh, in some sort of constraint, whereas women secretly know their greater potential. Okay, so even though we have this historical sort of tradition of matriarchies, mat matrilineal societies with indigenous traditions, why is it that we still see gender inequality within those traditions? Well, right, some notions, right, might lend off of the idea that women's powers are seen as something that need to be controlled, right, or that men are sort of ambivalent or not as interested in the spiritual powers of women. Right? The idea here is that women's powers are seen as elusive, sort of beyond human categories, something that perhaps men just can't understand. Or more seriously, that again, they're something to be afraid of because they are dangerous. Right? So what might the perceived power of women uh, be a threat to men in, one's, in society? And could it be complementary in another? Right? So we want to acknowledge that maybe we can grant people power without seeing it as a threat, but seeing it as being a complement, right? Something that they can add to a society. Bringing this back to history and myth, right? As I've noted, we're going to see a lot of traditions which started out with female deities, which are now seen as male, right? And so in myths, we can see that this sort of contradiction has emerged because of that, right? So they've maintained some elements of women's spirituality, but because they have been sort of co-opted in patriarchal structures, we're going to see this other sort of flip side view of them, um, which creates some problems. So when women are viewed negatively, this tends to be because they are attributed with causing human suffering, right? So not just the victims of suffering, right? Not just, um, you know, partially responsible, but in pretty much every religion, we're going to see uh, suffering tends to be embodied as being caused by women. And this is not just, you know, in the, the probably most well-known story of, you know, Adam and Eve and the fall from the Garden of Eden in uh, the Abrahamic traditions, but also we see this in indigenous traditions um, very often in the East. We'll see um, the notion that great uh, empires and communities are brought down, crumbled because of something that a woman did or didn't do. Um, and we'll see the idea that women as the ca primary cause of suffering are then the honorable thing for them to do to avoid causing suffering is usually something that involves self-sacrifice. Right, so the idea here is that women have misbehaved in some way, typically um, in the sense that they have violated some commandment that a man has given them, and that their misbehavior is thus the, the reason for why other people must suffer. When women are viewed positively within these myths, it tends to be, again, in the rare acknowledgement of their high spiritual potential because of that power, right? And so because of this, again, in indigenous traditions primarily, we will see them not only hold a number of positions of authority like shamans, but also as priestesses and healers. Okay, 
So one of the things that um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, and uh, if this is particularly uncomfortable for you, you can by all means uh, skip ahead, but it is important to note that there is a practice that is still widely practiced today, um, but it is falsely associated with certain religious traditions. And so I want to make it clear that female genital cutting, female genital circumcision, or female genital mutilation, as it is often called, is something that has been taken up as practice within certain traditions, but is not dictated by any religious tradition. So it is something that historians think actually predates many of these religious traditions, and then was just sort of brought up in it, but not explicitly within any of those uh, traditions, doctrines, or texts. And so this has to do directly with, again, the fear or the notion that a woman's spiritual power is dangerous and thus somehow connected to her sexuality, right? And so if a woman's sexuality is the source of her power, typically in the sense that it's connected to the notion of her being able to bear children, well, then it's going to lead to efforts to contain or shape that power, right? So to give you a brief definition of what female circumcision is, it is any procedure involving the partial or total removal of the external female genitalia or other injury to the female genital organs, whether for cultural, religious, or non-therapeutic reasons. The term is almost exclusively used to describe traditional or religious procedures on a minor, which requires the parent's consent because of the age of the girl. So there have been many efforts to eradicate FGM and FGC worldwide, but most of them have been ineffective. Um, as a result, it, many people will just take their children to other countries where the practice is still legal and uh, will have it done to them there. So we need to talk about this practice, um, what the motivations are behind it and why it is so problematic. Right? And one of the reasons that some of these efforts have been widely ineffective, as you'll see in uh, some media in my Women in World Religions class, is that this is something that is seen as a social norm, again, more so than even a religious one. And so it must be addressed from the, from the society more largely. It's not something that just individuals can opt out of because there are going to be severe social um, and thus economic repercussions if you don't have the procedure done. So perhaps if this procedure is seen as necessary to maintain a young girl's virginity, she will not be able to find a suitable marriage partner, right, when she comes of age, things like this. Okay, so there are lots of different types of FGM and FGC. Right, why the different names? Well, mutilation itself, right, is seen as capturing the fact that this is not just um, a practice that mutilates the body, but that it is a violation of basic human rights. And the reason for this is that the age of the girls typically is that they are old enough to remember having the procedure done to them, but not old enough to consent. This is uh, contrasted with how male circumcision is typically performed, which is after an infant male is only a couple of days old, and in which case they're not seen as having the, uh, at least the mental trauma, right, that go along with such a procedure. Cutting, right, is a term that we would see more often in the societies that actually engage in the practice and tends to resemble more closely the language that is used to describe them. So again, why not circumcision, right? That notion, as it is widely accepted in the West for men, sort of understates the seriousness of the effects of FGM and FGC. So we're going to talk about some of the differences between male and female circumcision, but it's important to understand that there are both physical effects that happen as a result of these procedures, as well as psychological impacts for the rest of these individuals' lives. So again, that term sort of conflates male and female circumcision, but they're really different in their practices. Okay, so female genital cutting, as opposed to male circumcision, tends to be performed under unhygienic circumstances, and again, on individuals of all ages, but again, typically on minors between the ages of four and 10 years old. So it's seen as being um, necessary to wait until they're old enough to, um, you know, be 
sort of responsible enough for their own bowels yet before they hit puberty. Right, so they're too young to decide or judge for themselves whether or not they want the procedure. So this procedure is then um, forced upon them typically by their parents. And what's interesting is if you watch some of the media about this, you'll notice that um, a lot of men don't seem to be of a very strong opinion about whether or not women do this. I mean, that's not always the case. But because men and women don't talk about these things, women are still under the impression that it's very important to the men. And so you'll see the idea that mothers are making this decision for their, da their daughters, even though they regret and are traumatized by having it done to themselves, they still think mistakenly that they're doing something that is actually in their daughter's best interest. Now it's important to know that because a number of countries have tried to ban this practice, uh, the age of the pra uh, people who are having this done to this, the girls that are having it done to them, is decreasing because they're having to, as I mentioned earlier, flee to other countries and it's a lot easier to control a young girl, right, than an older girl when ha taking them somewhere else to have this done to them. Okay, so if you think that this is maybe something that's not widely practiced, there are at least 200 million people alive today who have had it done to them. Okay, so again, is it a specifically religious practice? No, it is not explicitly supported by any religion or sacred text, and it has been associated not just with an indigenous traditions, but also with Abrahamic religions, primarily Islam and Judaism. Judaism more so uh, with male circumcision. So as a result, we cannot just simply say this is a manifestation of misogyny or hostility towards women, again, because it is done to boys as well, and that a lot of women, as I mentioned, end up making that decision for them, right? So one of the things to consider and whether or not we might find these practices morally permissible is to talk about whether or not it happens to both having any sort of impact, right? Does that mean that it's not an issue? Or does it mean that maybe we should take a look at whether or not male circumcision is permissible as well? All right, so um, if you're interested, I can share some FGC uh, fact sheets with you. Here, I'll, I'll share those with you now. Um, so by comparison for boys, circumcision tends to be performed in a hospital shortly after birth or shortly after leaving the hospital in a cultural or religious ceremony and tends to be performed by trained individuals. If it happens in the hospital, it's done typically by a doctor. If it happens in a cultural ceremony, it's done by a specific uh, practitioner of that faith. Um, and there might be a sort of ritual practice that goes along with it. And it was historically seen as having certain health benefits specifically related to personal hygiene. So the idea was that um, the foreskin on male genitalia would be more likely to contain bacteria and thus removing the foreskin would reduce the likelihood of spreading uh, viruses and specifically STDs. That actually though is changing because hygiene amongst humanity has improved so much that these sorts of health benefits are now to, thought to not really even occur. For girls, again, it happens when they're older, old enough to deeply remember the painful experience, yet too young to make an informed decision, and it's typically performed by medically untrained professionals. So again, typically by individuals who are uh, within that indigenous tradition, seen as um, having certain positions of authority. And it's often done with rudimentary instruments, which are unsanitized, right? So they're not in a sterile environment. And the types of instruments that are often used include razor blades, broken glass, and knives. And again, there are both short and long-term health risks for girls because of this. Um, there's also some studies now being done to see if those same t types of uh, damage, especially to the nerves and sensitiv sensitivity, occur with boys as well. Right, so why is it that these things are practiced if not for religious reasons? Well, again, there's this notion of a social sort of issue, not just that this woman is, or this young woman is going to have a spiritual power that is beyond her control, but that she will now have the power to marry, right? And that it will illustrate her womanhood, right? In her sexual debut. So the idea is that you are controlling 
um, anyone's access to her genitalia until she is married, and then that will be broken by the husband. Although many women have, uh, who have shared their experiences of female genital cutting have acknowledged that sometimes um, the, the stitching or the, the healed part of, of the cutting has not been fully torn during sexual acts, and so sometimes it's not likely to tear until they give uh, birth, which can make an already painful process even more painful. Again, the economic reason to ensure that they get married to keep their virginity, uh, specifically not just by making it perhaps more difficult for a man to penetrate them, but by supposedly limiting their sexual desire, right? So the idea is that you have somehow removed um, their ability to enjoy sex, right? Or to um, have a very strong libido and that that will help control her virginity. Then there's the political aspects, right? The sort of social pressure on a family to ensure that this happens, right? One is seen as protected, protecting the family's good name by having this done. Otherwise, again, they might face uh, stigma, right? Or backlash retribution from others. There's also some really interesting superstitions that have grown up around this idea. And again, none of this is, is true, unfortunately, but it is widely believed. And the idea here is that if the clitoris is not cut on a young girl, then somehow it will continue to keep growing like indefinitely. And that the, that might turn into male genitalia or that uncut genitals are unclean and can cause the death of an infant, an infant upon birth, right? So by pushing these superstitions again, the idea is that families are convinced that by having this procedure done to their daughters, it's actually in everyone's best interest. So what are the types of health risks that um, occur as a result of female genital cutting? Well, this of course depends on the degree of cutting. Again, there are at least three different kinds um, that are included in a graph on an earlier slide. The cleanliness of the tools, of course, is going to matter and the prior health of the girl. But some of the common short-term side effects are bleeding and hemorrhaging, which if not properly, um, you know, if someone's not in a condition to maintain uh, hygiene and care properly can result in death. In serious infection, right? So typically um, when the girls are cut and then stitched together, there is only a small hole left open uh, for one to, to urinate out of and urinating through an open wound, right? Can cause very serious infection and can result in death as well. Of course, the pain itself. So there's not any anesthesia that's given to these young girls. So not just the pain during, but also afterwards, as well as the trauma, right? So having this done against your own will, right? Oftentimes being physically held down, I, I can only imagine what sort of trauma that that would cause for a young girl. And that's not to mention the long-term side effects, right? So trouble urinating or menstruating due to infection, right? This can cause long-term issues inability to have sex normally due to um, levels of scarring that have occurred, inability to be examined. So if anyone is interested in going into a medical field, um, it's very difficult to, to treat someone who has had this procedure done to them, not only because they don't teach you about it in medical school, but also just because of the level of scarring, again, makes um, those parts of the bodies difficult to access for treatment. And actually, right, as we saw with the previous belief that having male circumcision reduces the risk of STDs, actually female genital cutting tends to increase the risk of STDs due to the lack of sterilization during the procedure and damage that is done to the female sex organs. Also interestingly enough, it is seen as increasing a risk of infertility because it causes health risks, not just to the mother, but also to the child, specifically during childbirth, right? Not to mention the long-term trauma, such as PTSD, which can manifest in insomnia, anxiety, and depression. Right, so in lieu of these uh, horrific sorts of side effects, um, Again, it's important to acknowledge what symbolism these practices hold, right? 
it's typically done prior to a young girl hitting puberty because again when a girl hits puberty that sexual power that ability to give birth is seen as something very powerful as well as a right or a transition into adulthood right and so oftentimes not only will there be practices surrounding um, female genital cutting in various indigenous traditions but also certain practices that involve first menstruation or a girl's first period right this is seen as symbolizing a girl becoming a woman right because they are seen as being biologically ready for childbirth this typically involves seclusion in a hut or lodge right which is interpreted by outsiders negatively but by a lot of practitioners right um, because it's associated with the idea that women need to be separate because they're there's something scary going on right the danger of their spiritual power or again the um, unfortunate stereotype that menstruation is unclean in some way but actually a lot of practitioners um, of various indigenous traditions and even some contemporary, fe contemporary feminist interpretations view the seclusion as in a positive way Right? They see it as a chance for women to spend time together. Right, It's not seen as a punishment, but a time for them to celebrate their womanhood apart from men. 